Hello, let's talk about my five favorite Stephen King books of all time. Stephen King is one of the most prolific American authors of recent memory. He published his first book in the 1970s and he is still publishing books today. He's known for his works of horror, but as of late he's dappled of other genres. He is incredibly pro prolific and that is why he's captured the hearts of millions of readers around the world. Why is my list different than many other Stephen King constant readers? Because I am new to Stephen King. I'm in my 20s. Many of his fans have been reading since they were children, since they were born in the 70s. And because of that, I've had a very limited view of Stephen King's works, particularly his most popular works. I have never read it. I have never read The Stand. These books are often in people's top tens. But I've read 15 Stephen King books, and I think I've been able to avoid, by just crazy chance, his most popular works. So I think my top five books will be pretty interesting because they're some of his less known masterpieces, in my humble opinion. If I'm being honest, I was very conflicted about whether or not to make this video because I've only read 15 of Stephen King's books. But on the other hand, that's a very exciting thing because there's a lot of potential for this top five to change. And Stephen King's going to be a major focus for me in 2024. And next year, my top five will most definitely be different. A few years down the road, my top 10 may not include any of these five books I'm going to talk about. And that's just an exciting thing as a Stephen King constant reader. I'm going to learn. I'm going to become more familiar with Stephen King's other works. And this list is going to change. So let's just get into it. Number five, The Eyes of the Dragon. This book pissed off a lot of Stephen King readers when it came out in the 80s. Because this is one of the first books Stephen King wrote that wasn't in the horror genre. He was gaining a bunch of momentum as an author. He published The Eyes of the Dragon. It's a fantasy with some thriller elements, but definitely not horror. And it divided his fan base. It's a good book. But if you were expecting a horror read, I can see why you'd be very upset with it. I loved this high fantasy setting. It has some ties to the Dark Tower universe. And it's told in the same tone and voice as like a father reading a fairy tale to his children. And that is how The Eyes of the Dragon was developed as a story. The Eyes of the Dragon tells the story of two young princes. One is the prodigious heir to the throne, and one exists in his brother's shadows. There's a lot of tropes inside this story. There's a dark wizard, there's a witless king, there's the paragon, and then there's a brother who's kind of a reject. And the plot, you can kind of guess a lot of the points. There was a thrilling chase scene at the end that had me on my toes. The villain is top-notch. You'll probably remember him from some of Stephen King's other works. There are some ties to the Dark Tower. There's lots for a Stephen King constant reader to like about The Eyes of the Dragon. And if you're like me, you're born in the 2000s, you're probably not going to be super off balance when you read this expecting some horror read because that is not what it is at all. I loved it. It was one of the first Stephen King books that I read. And it let me know right off the bat that Stephen King is a very versatile author who can do a lot more than just write stories about killer clowns and plagues that destroy all humanity. Book number four, Revival. This book came out in 2014, and I read it in 2020. And as of right now, it is the most terrifying Stephen King book I have ever read. I believe it is criminally underrated by many Stephen King constant readers, and that's just a shame. The plot of this book is centered around Jamie, our main protagonist, a young boy musician, and Charles Jacob his youth minister from his church. At the beginning of this book, a tragedy strikes, and it deeply affects both our main characters. Decades pass, they come into contact with each other again, and we see how the years have affected them. And it, it's, it's a little unhinged. Revival has some of Stephen King's most popular mainstay tropes. We have a main character that suffers from drug addiction. We have young love depicted in a very icky, awkward way, and we have the dangers of religious fanaticism. A lot of things that are very prevalent in Stephen King's other works. The climax of Revival was terrifying. It made up for the giant slog in the middle. This book's a little over 400 pages, but for me, it just flew by. Revival is very much a love letter to Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, and H.P. Lovecraft. You could see the prominent themes and influences of those works on this work, and I think Stephen King pulled off this Frankenstein of a book in a very masterful way. Book number three, Billy Summers, one of Stephen King's most recent works. 
It's a story we're all very familiar with. The old hitman gets one last job that seems too good to be true. Something goes wrong and he has to survive the fallout. Billy is far and away my favorite Stephen King protagonist. He's not just a hitman. He's a man of great intelligence that hides behind a very dumb face. He's surrounded by detestable, despicable individuals, and he doesn't like them, and they don't like him. And he pretends, he keeps up the charade, that they're taking advantage of him. And when the opportunity presents itself, Billy wins you over about two hours into this book. He's a great mentor figure. He's got a lot of love in his heart, and he's trying to right wrongs. And how could you not root for a character like that? Not only is he a bad A hitman, he's got a heart of gold, and he's going to do whatever he has to do to make things right. So this book has a lot of the ingredients that are needed for a great thrilling story, and I think you give this book a few more years, and all the Stephen King constant readers will be talking about Billy Summers. Stephen King has a well-earned reputation for ending his books badly. He doesn't know how to close off a story, but that is not the case for Billy Summers. The resolution to this story brought tears to my eyes. It was super cathartic. And I'm of the belief, and it's, in the mi it's a minority belief, that Stephen King is a better writer in the 2020s than he was in the t 1980s. Most Stephen King constant readers will disagree with me, but that's just how I see it. Book number two on this list is near and dear to my heart, and that book is The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. The story of Trisha McFarlane, a young nine-year-old girl who gets lost off the Appalachian Trail and has to fight for survival, it just got me. This book hits different when you have children of your own. Stephen King is very good at writing from the point of view and perspective of children. Children don't do rational things. They remember things adults told them in patchwork ways. They don't remember all the details, and they're just doing their best. And Trisha, how could you not root for a nine-year-old girl surviving against the elements, being hunted by a monster? Perhaps it's supernatural, perhaps it's just the imaginings of a young child's brain. But I was on my toes, the edge of my seat, the entire time I read The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. I read it in one day. The ending of this book brought tears to my eyes. If there was one negative about this book, it is that there is a lot of references to baseball. Stephen King is a big fan of America's favorite game. I am not. I know nothing about baseball. And the constant references were a little annoying, and I had to, you know, Google what certain things meant. A nine-year-old girl finding solace by imagining her favorite baseball player seems really weird, but children aren't rational, so I guess it makes sense, like having an imaginary friend. That being said, I still don't think that was a big enough negative to greatly affect this story in the slightest. It didn't affect the pacing. It didn't affect my ability to understand what was happening. And this book is so underrated. A few years ago, this was my favorite Stephen King book. And I'm pretty sure if I, re if I reread it, it might retake the number one spot. And finally, my favorite Stephen King book of all time, as of March 2024, The Drawing of the Three, the second installment in Stephen King's Dark Tower series. When I read The Gunslinger, I wasn't sure if The Dark Tower was my cup of tea. But after concluding The Drawing of the Three, there was no looking back. I could not not continue on with this journey. This story was super compelling because it follows the gunslinger Roland, who is absolutely mad. He's crazy. He's off his rocker. He does very questionable things, especially towards the end of the gunslinger. But the drawing of the three is all about him gathering his quartet, the fellowship of individuals that are going to help him reach the Dark Tower. This book has action scenes. It has good group politics. It has Roland saying really funny things, putting himself in very interesting situations. There is robberies, and there's a naked gunfight. I never knew how much I needed a naked gunfight. It sounds ridiculous, and it is ridiculous, but it makes sense in the context of this story. It is all over the place. It is King at his best. He's creative. You could tell he's not plotting a lot of things, and the story just flows really well. It's a lot of fun. If you read The Gunslinger, you may not want to continue on with The Dark Tower. But after finishing The Drawing of Three, I think you'll have a hard time putting down this series. This book 
is one of the main reasons I'm focusing on Stephen King for 2024. Because to understand everything that is happening in the Dark Tower, you have to read Stephen King's other more popular works. You have to read The Stand. You have to read Salem's Lot. You have to read other things from his massive bibliography to understand everything that is happening in the Dark Tower. So because of this book, this silly book of naked gunfights and good action scenes, I'm reading a lot of doorstopper size Stephen King books for 2024. And this book's probably one of the main reasons this list, this top five, this top 10 list, whatever, is going to be so different next March. So what do you think? Is my list stupid? What are your top five Stephen King books of all time? What books should I be focusing on for the rest of this year? What books are sure to knock any of these five books off my list? I'm excited for you to give me your opinions. I hope you liked this video. If you liked it, push that little thumbs up icon below, subscribe to my channel, and all that jazz. And I'll see you guys next time.